1 Thessalonians in chapter 4. I'll use this opportunity to, again, plug the uh, sermon conversation guides. If you did not grab one, um, we had a small stack out front. Uh, we're trying to gauge this as needed. Um, we're taking the Amazon model in that regard, and we're printing on demand. So if we see more of a demand, we'll print more of them. Next week, Marcy gave me uh, the input that sometimes I use words that may be unfamiliar, and that this would be a great way to, uh, to you know, define some of those words if I know they're going to come up in the sermon. So in that, in that uh, vein, I've made this, this particular sermon exceptionally confusing in order to encourage your use of that guide. So I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. No, I did want to make, make one mention. Um, We've mentioned this before, but one of our distinctives here at Grace is that we expositionally preach. So we try to preach through chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the Bible. Um, And our effort as Christians should be a regular diet of God's Word. Um, I I think if we were thinking of God's Word, we would do well to think of it as a diet. We're ingesting, we're imbibing God's Word, and we're supposed to have a regular diet of God's Word. Now in that vein, I have a prayer as a pastor, as somebody who's preaching God's Word, believe it or not, my prayer every time I preach or teach is what Paul's prayer was in Colossians 4.4. 4. He said that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So part of my burden, and I see some of you chuckling, that's okay, I love you nonetheless. But believe it or not, part of my burden is taking God's word and all of its depth and all of the things that I cannot explain because of my limitations, but then trying to make it accessible to where our people can understand it. So that's the burden of all of our teachers here, whether they're in the Sunday schools in the back with the kids or whether they're leading on a Wednesday night, that's, that, that is our aim, is to make God's Word accessible. Now there's another flip side to that. The, the flip side is what Christ commanded us in Matthew 28, 20. He said, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. These are the two balances, taking God's Word and making it accessible and clear as best we can, and yet at the same time doing what Christ commanded us to do, which is teaching you all that he has commanded. So this is, this is kind of the diet. If we're thinking of Scripture as the diet, and we're here in 1 Thessalonians 4, this is the diet. My children will choke if I feed them meat too early, right? So if you're a young parent, count this as good you know, free parenting advice. If you try to feed them you know, meat at two months old, they might not do well with that. However, if you never feed them meat, they will be malnourished, or at least some sort of protein diet. You understand what I mean. We cannot go on with baby food. We need solid food at a certain point. So this is, this is then the charge, the balance of this. If we're to think, again, we're all God's children. If we are a, child, if we are a Christian, we are a child of God. If that's the case, we have a lot of different types of children in our family, right? We have some that prefer Little Caesars and some that are eating a little, a little more heady meat. So this is, this is the call then. I will malnourish our flock or our, any of our teachers will malnourish our flock if we don't provide enough a depth of teaching, enough of God's Word, not, not shying away and making it very, very simple, but instead giving you a good balance. So all that to say, this is my encouragement to you. If certain things seem a bit difficult to chew, that's okay. Um, that's one reason why we're doing the Sermon Conversation Guides, so we can walk through some of those things later in the week. But I would also just encourage you, if you hear something you might not be familiar with, or something sounds odd, and you, you feel challenged, or maybe I use a word on accident that's, that's a little bit wordy, just dismiss that and instead chew through what is accessible. That's not, that's not a knock on any of us. All of us have different styles of learning and different ways of hearing God's Word. But I say that for your encouragement. We want to present a full meal. And like any full meal, some of those things I'm not going to like as much. Some of them are going to be more difficult to chew. But the point for us is, is that we're steadily giving that solid meal of God's Word. Does that make sense to everybody, why we do the expositional preaching? I thought that might be, might be better because this is the way of teaching that Paul mirrors in this letter. We're trying to do this not because that sounds like a good idea, but it seems like that is how Paul, to the Thessalonians, is presenting this letter among the other letters. It's an encouragement to the church, but there's also things in there which Peter shamelessly says are difficult to understand at times, right? There's some depth to some of what Paul says, but this is meant for our encouragement. So in that vein, if you would, go ahead and stand with me. We stand to honor the reading of God's Word, and I'll be reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'll be reading the first Eight verses. Hear now the word of the living God. Finally, then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you were doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Jesus. 
For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, we are thankful, Lord, for your word. We pray, Lord, that as we strive to understand the instructions and the admonitions and the guidance that you would give us, Lord, would you give us open hearts and open ears, Lord? Would your spirit do what only you can do, Lord, and that is to apply your word to your children for your glory. We ask all these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. So, three things to walk through this morning. The first is, does God give instructions to his children? Does God give instructions to his children? I know some of these sound like no does. Some of these might sound like freebie Sunday school answers. I promise you that they're not. These are good questions for us to ask as Christians. So, first, I have to point this out, because as someone who, who regularly preaches, I would point out Paul is, is a preacher, okay? Okay. Um, we can think of Paul in a lot of different ways. He's a church planter, he's an apostle, but he's also a preacher. So if you look at Paul's ministry, it's dominated by the preaching of God's word. When Paul went into a town, he preached God's word. When we see massive revivals in the ministry of the apostles, we see it uh, instigated and carried on by the preaching of God's word. That's one of the reasons why we, we find Paul, when he's not preaching and teaching, he's writing to the churches, essentially small sermons in these letters that he's sending then to the churches. However, here we can see an undeniably clear mark of a preacher. Here in this letter, he makes it sound as if he is wrapping it up, and it, there's about half the letter still to go. Right here at the beginning. That was a joke, by the way. You can snicker a little bit at that. Paul gives you final instructions, which, which is why I've given you final instructions for the sermon title in, in air quotes, right? Um, Paul's going to give you some final instructions. Here's the application, and yet this is really the meaty second half, then, of this letter he's writing to the Thessalonians. We see that major transition mark. If you're looking in your text, there's not only finally, but there's also a finally, therefore. Finally, therefore. It, it may be translated as then in your, in your Bible, but it's that, that Greek word, un. So we can think of it as that finally, therefore, which whenever we see that, we ask, what is the therefore, therefore, right? We're looking back and we're saying, what is Paul building then? As he's wrapping it up, what is all this being built from? So just glancing back, if you're in your text, we ended last week by speaking there in verse 13 of chapter 3, Paul was speaking of God directing and preparing them. And, and here in verse 13 of chapter 3, he says, So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And we pointed out last week that that word, the coming of the Lord, that's that word parousia. Parousia, it's the coming, the presence then of the Lord. Here, here in this passage, this is directing us toward his final coming. We have our eyes directed in this passage toward that final, climactic, ultimate coming of Christ. And we get a little bit of that indication because it says the coming of the Lord Jesus with his saints, right? This is the victorious king then coming back and reclaiming, and he has all of his entourage, all of his servants are in the wings celebrating along with him as he comes back. This is referring then to his final coming, and I think that's important for us to point out because Paul, it seems that Paul never leaves that very far from his mind. Whenever Paul's writing these letters and he's, whenever he has a concern or even a, a joy that to share with the believers, it seems that Christ's coming is never very far off in his, in his reasoning. There's also a positional element that he refers to here. He's, he talks about, he's, again, looking at chapter 3, verse 13, he says, "...so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness." He's going to continue that as we expect, right? We, we, he's now summing these things up and concluding. He's going to continue that theme of holiness here in our passage. But I want to point out one thing about holiness because this is an important distinction. We hinted at it last week. I just want to make it explicit. There's a positional element to holiness. And when I say positional, I mean a position in which you are standing and unmoved. Your location, right? There's a positional element to holiness. Holiness means set apart. It means a lot more than that, but it at least means set-apartness, right? God has set us apart 
in Christ. So if you were to think of this just very broad brushstrokes, here's holiness. God has taken his children and placed us there. You positionally stand in Christ's holiness. But there's also a progressive sense, an ongoing sense to holiness, an outworking, we could say, of that holiness in our lives. In other words, if you are standing there in holiness, you're going to be growing in holiness. You guys following what I'm saying here? This is a very important distinction for Christians. We often refer to that growing in holiness, and we just kind of say sanctification. That's kind of the word, even that Paul, you heard that in the text. Paul uses that same kind of term. But that is the outworking of where we stand growing out through our lives. Positional versus progressive holiness. And these two are inseparable. Paul's going to hone in on that. The reason I point this out at the front end, verses 3 through 7, Paul's going to really hone in on this, this theme. If you stand there, you will experience growing sanctification. Again, very important for the Christian life. If we are holy and blameless before God, we will experience the growing of holiness and sanctification in our lives. There will be an undeniable outworking then of where we stand. Ultimately, if we are being grown in Christ and we're experiencing this sanctification process, God says we will be holy and we'll be holy because we're following the thrice holy God. It really matters, and we're going to pick up on this a little bit further in the sermon, time, time allowing as always, but we're going to look like God because we're following God, and God is a thrice holy God. One of the, one of the, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing in Scripture, and it's also an intimidating thing in Scripture. Scripture makes clear that you will look like what you worship. You're going to grow to resemble what you worship. If you are truly worshiping the thrice holy God, guess what? That's going to look, you're going to start to look like him. His work in your life, that positional holiness and that sanctification process, you're going to start to look like him. But it cuts both ways, doesn't it? Because conversely, if you're following and loving and worshiping ultimately something else, you're going to grow to look like that thing too, which can be a scary prospect, I think, if we, if we were to think of how that could work out. Yeah, when, when I was reading this, I was just reminded, thinking of God's holiness and Paul's call here to holiness, I was thinking of the seraphim which cried out to one another in Isaiah's vision, these, these angelic figures, they cry out in Isaiah 6.3, Holy, 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 thrice holy, 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 holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That includes you, that includes me, as we are growing in sanctification because of what, what God has accomplished for us. So this then, if you were to think of how is Paul working this out from where he's been before. How is he concluding this? This is working out of what he said in chapter 3, verse 10. So again, if you're in your text, just look at chapter 3, verse 10. He said, as we pray, and again, he's speaking of himself and his, his, two, his two cohorts, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. This is, this is a case, and it, it is all throughout Paul's letters to the point that I don't think we can stress this enough. There's two different things that happen in Paul's letters. There's statements about who God is and what God has done, and then there's commands that follow. Now, the fancy words, if I had thought about this before I printed the, the sermon conversation guides, these would have been two of the words I would have put, put in there for you. But these are indicatives versus imperatives, okay? Indicatives, God has done. It's a statement of fact. God has done something, and we're to recognize that. It's usually at the front end of Paul's letters, if you've noticed. He begins with that part. And what does that lead to then? You therefore do this. God has done something, therefore you live and grow and obey. It's very important that not only do we not confuse these two things, the indicatives and imperatives, but also we never take the imperatives without the indicatives. In other words, you don't read the second half of the letter and say, man, I better work hard in holiness. No, you read the first half and say, God has done something. Because he's done something, then I follow, then I grow in holiness. If you were to think about this, Paul is trying to instruct us in walking in a way that pleases God. And the reason I pointed that out about the indicatives and the imperatives is, this is, by definition, something that is for Christians. This is not a command for the world. We don't call the world to the imperatives without the indicatives. Our call to the world is repent, believe in the gospel, turn to Christ that you too may be saved. But we don't go to the world and say, you better be growing in sanctification and holiness. You bet your life better start looking like the thrice holy God. In fact, we should not expect that because Scripture does, does not give us that expectation. In fact, Paul in Romans 8, he says this, the mind that is set on the flesh, which that is all of us without God's regeneration in our heart, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. 
It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. These are instructions for Christians because there's an indicative that came first. God has sent His Son to live, die, and raise so that all who turn to Him and believe in His name will be saved. That is then what flows to this, this latter half. I point that out because we don't expect unbelievers to act like believers. But there's a, there's a qualifier I want to throw in there. We don't expect the world to act like the church. We don't expect a non-believer to act like a Christian. We want them to be saved and to see God at work in their life. However, the whole world, including the unbeliever, is held to God's law. Just because we don't expect the world to act like the church does not mean we do not call the world to repentance. Because God is a king who rules over all. And God does not, does not negate his law in some areas of his kingdom. His law is a good and perfect law, and it stretches all over his creation. So even though we don't expect the world to act like the church, we still caution the world and call them to turn from evil, to turn from sin, and to repent. Why? Because there's a king, as we've talked about on, in these, this series, there's a king, and that king has a law. And rebellion against that king is going to bring disastrous consequences, no matter where you stand in that kingdom. So, or in the kingdom or outside the kingdom, so to speak. So, one question here, and this may seem obvious. Does God give instructions to his children? The resounding, I see a couple of you cautiously shaking your heads. I, I, know, I know I'm apt to trap you with these sort of questions, but this, is, this should be a, a no-brainer, right? Yes, God gives instructions to his children. And yet that is not very popular within Western Christianity. That is not one that will preach in many pulpits, unfortunately, because for many Christians, the answer to that would be a resounding no. They'd say, no, 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 God having commands, that sounds a bit like, like Pharisaism. Sound a bit like legalism, maybe even. It, it, it certainly seems like some sort of religiosity for you to say that God has commands with his children. I would just encourage you to consider God is clear on how he calls his children to follow him. In other words, God is a good and loving father, and he calls us as his children but don't mistake for a minute that he just calls us in any way we want to follow. No, God, God gives us good and clear and beneficial instructions for how to follow him. All throughout his word, he's telling us, follow in this way, obey these commands and precepts. That's important because not only are they for our good, but they're also to prevent us from making our own way. If there's a king and he has a kingdom, he has the right then to call us to follow him as he has decreed. We've got to get back to the text here. So Paul says, we ask and urge you, in the Lord Jesus. We ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus. This is, this is kind of the tone. I point this little phrase out because this is the tone in which Paul is writing. And I hope this is the tone in which we proclaim truth and try to speak from God's word. This is a firm plea, and yet it's a gentle, loving plea. Do you hear the tone of Paul's voice in there? We are, we are pleading with you. We are urging you. It's not something selfish. It's not something self-serving. Paul's not trying to make for himself some sort of kingdom. No, he's not being domineering. He is urgently pleading. And he says, on behalf of Christ, observe these commands, Christian. Observe how Christ has called you to follow him. He continues, he said, As you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. How you ought to walk and to please God. So let me point out three quick things from this. If you're taking notes, this would be a little, little three-part mini-sermon. Uh, but three things from this. First, I would observe there's a way of walking that pleases God. This sermon, I know, is sounding quite pedantic, but I promise you this, this is going to pay dividends. There's a way of walking in which it pleases God. Now, the converse truth is what? There's a way of walking that does not please God. In other words, every way that I may come up with in my own mind to blaze my own trail does not please God. So I, I do well then, as a Christian, saved by grace, I do well to look to Scripture and say, how does God then call me to follow Him? That's number one. There's a way of walking that does please God. Second, and this is my plea, there is not a huge indecipherable mystery about how we are called to follow God. There is not a huge mystery which surrounds this. I know we may have quibbles. Should we have drums on stage or not? Obviously, we're okay with drums on stage, right? Rick's not out of a job yet. But, um, but so like Christians may have these little quibbles, but ultimately we're thinking about broad, broad brushstrokes here, how to follow God. There's not a huge mystery. We may get this a little bit sideways in our own minds, but I would say if we turn to Scripture consistently, it's pretty clear how God has called us to follow Him as Christians. 
We do so, we turn to Scripture because Scripture is divine revelation. This is God's way of speaking directly to us. He's given us His perfect Word. We call it special revelation because you can't go out in the forest necessarily and look at the trees, the leaves on the trees and appreciate the squirrels in the forest and decipher how then to follow God in a way that pleases Him. But we have the Bible. God has given us His Word. He talks about this in 2 Timothy chapter 3.16. I know we've quoted this one before, but it's worth repeating. All Scripture is breathed out by God, that word theonoustos, breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Okay? Everybody following me so far? So first, there is a way of walking that pleases God. Second, it is clear through Scripture how we are to walk in that way. Third, it should be the primary goal of our existence to walk in that way. That's your calling. That's why we're here. That is our goal then is to walk in a way then that pleases the God who has saved us. We need to point that out even to one another as Christians because people are naturally hedonists. And I use that word with all the insult that 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 word carries. We live in our flesh for self-pleasure. I make my rule. I do what I want. I will seek out the things that gratify me, even for the moment, even if it brings destruction. I want to live in a way that I express self-rule in my life. Everything about what I'm reading you today is Paul pleading with the congregation, turn from that, which will lead only to death. Follow God in the way he's called you to. It is a complete abandonment of that self-rule. And if you think I'm being a little bit bit hard on that, I would just encourage you, how do even Christians, how are we tempted sometimes to make decisions in our life? What job should I take? Whatever makes you happy. Am, Am I wrong? Let me, let me give you a couple more. Who should I marry? Whoever makes you happy. What church should I join? Wherever I feel happy. What sort of life should I live? Whatever makes you happy. I hear this from Christians constantly. Not here, don't worry. None of you are on the, on the pastor's bad list. But seriously, this is the things we tell each other, though Scripture says that leads to death. What makes us happy. It, the, the fancy word I'm throwing in, I told you I was going to make this one really confusing to encourage your use of the sermon discussion guide or sermon conversation guides. This is our culture's ethic, and it's something called eudaimonism. Jot that down and use it in jeopardy one day. Eudaimonism. But this is what it is. It's a system of ethics that places moral value on the likelihood that good actions will produce happiness. What is good? Whatever produces the most happiness for the most people. You don't have to know the term to appreciate the fact that this is rampant in Western culture. And this is rampant within the Western church. What is good? Whatever produces the most happiness. This is the dominant philosophy, as best as I can tell, within a lot of Greek philosophy. But I think it's alive and well within the West and tragically within the Western church. What makes you happy? And then we stand back having pursued whatever makes us happy in every given decision of our lives. We wonder, why is it that we made a shipwreck of things chasing a fleeting happiness of this world. This is what Paul's... Remember, Paul's not writing to these people out of, out of some sort of detached view. He cares for their souls. That's the tone of this letter to the Thessalonians. He cares deeply for these believers, and he's saying, flee that. Walk in a way that pleases God and produces holiness. So all of that, the chasing happiness, versus what Paul expresses as the Christian life. The Christian life, if I could just sum it up, is that with every decision, in every circumstance, with every thought, we consider what will please the God who saved me. That's the Christian's call. If we pursue that, God gives us true joy, true peace, true lasting happiness. But it's not in our pursuit of the happiness itself, which is so fleeting. It's in our pursuit of God and how He's called us to follow Him. So if we go back to the text, this is why Paul can be so bold as to say, verse 2, he says, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. And I want to pause there for a minute because this is quite a statement. Paul is saying, God has spoken. You catch that, right? Paul is saying, I gave you instructions through the Lord Jesus. In other words, God has spoken. And contrary to much popular belief, that's an incredibly big deal. You will not hear me say that when expounding my own thoughts from a pulpit. God has spoken. Only when I read Scripture would I say that. The Old Testament prophets, if you're familiar with this, what was the standard of the Old Testament? And someone spoke for God where God has not spoken? That was a, that was a capital offense. That person must die for saying that God has spoken when God has not. Ezekiel 22 speaks of this. 
Ezekiel 22, speaking of a wayward nation, says, And her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God when the Lord has not spoken. You hear the condemnation in that passage. This is one of the reasons why charlatans and hucksters that, that wear the title of Christian and do pledge drives on TV networks are not funny to me. You know, you fill in the blank, right? You, you can point out a few that are, that are quite obvious. That's not funny to me. When someone gets up as a charlatan and claims the name of God and tells people who are listening with their ears, God has spoken, giving prophecies when God has not spoken, speaking words when God has not spoken. Scripture doesn't say that those are cute missteps. Scripture says they're an abomination to God. And I point that all out to say Paul is using serious language. And it's not language we should be flippant with in our day and age. The, the reason for that should be, should be clear, but I'm going to point it out. It's an abomination to God because it waylays and it confuses the flock when the shepherd has, in fact, spoken. That is the whole problem with it. God has spoken. We should be careful to put any sort of stumbling block in front of that for God's people. So opposed to that, then, Paul... Paul speaks of instructions. If you're following in the ESV, it uses the word instructions that he's giving. Um, I quite like the way the NASB and the LSB translate it as commands. Carries a little more weight, doesn't it? These are commandments, excuse me, according to the LSB, NASB translation of that. But this may, this may kind of dissuade us of some of our somewhat rebellious thinking. Um, some, some of our thinking that says God doesn't really tell us how to follow. It's God pretty much saves us, and then he, he's pretty much good with however we follow him, right? Like God's just, you know, he's smiling no matter how, how we decide to live our lives or how we decide to, to, to follow him and worship him. We're following how God has called us through Christ. It's a commandment, which is serious, but it's a gloriously loving commandment because it's a commandment through Christ, in other words, this is not a command of follow me or you'll lose your salvation. It's not a commandment of follow me and obey lest you not be saved because that would be a despairing commandment. None of us could earn that. This is a commandment that through God's Spirit working in His children, you can follow Him in a way that pleases Him. It's a liberating commandment if that makes sense. I would also point out just as an aside, this is why the law of God still impacts the believer. And I want to move quickly through this, but I thought it was pertinent. When we speak about the law, and I'm thinking like law with a capital L, um, we may consider this what, what's typically referred to as that third use of that law. So if you're to think of how the law works within Scripture, th there's, there's typically three ways that people will point to. The, the, the first way is it condemns us. If you want a really good illustration for how that works, read Pilgrim's Progress, right? Pilgrim going along with that heavy burden, that's the law condemning us, right? It, God wants you to feel the weight of your sin so that you may be saved and turned to Christ. Its second use, though, is it restrains evil. It holds back the evil in this world. Um, typically, when something terrible happens, somebody will ask me, can you believe they did that? And I know this sounds terribly pessimistic on my part, but I promise it's not. My typical response is, I'm surprised more people aren't that wicked. Why is there not more? If, if we are as wicked and as sinful as Scripture paints the picture, why is there not more evil in this world? Because God restrains evil. Third use, though, and this is what Calvin called the principal use of the law, God's law guides and directs the Christian. And this is what we're getting to here. How do I know what the guardrails are? How do I know what the road is pointed toward? The law is given that I may have that guidance and direction in this life. So I point those things out because this is the takeaway. The law and the commands of God are good. They reveal His eternal will and His eternal character, and they're meant for our good and for our flourishing. We get a little bit of this in, in 1 John chapter 5, in verses 2 and 3. John says this, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. Do you hear that? For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. The love of God is expressed through these commandments. Follow me and live, He's saying to His children. It's not a law to earn salvation, but it's a law to obey the one who has saved us. That's why it's not burdensome for the Christian. Looking back at verse 1 then of our text, Paul said, Just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. So just to return kind of into the theme, this is the testimony that Paul has been lauding and building in the Thessalonians. The faith and the love of the, the Thessalonians, it is a testimony that God is working through their lives. 
It is a testimony then that God is supplying what is needed. With almost no time left, let's get to point number two. <laughs> point number two. Um, let's see how fast I can talk. What is the content then of God's instructions for us? What's the content then? I'm going to look at verse 3 through 7. I'm going to reread it just very, very quickly because this is a meaty part. He says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. So let's pause there for a minute and work through this because this is a, this is a meaty section. Why start with sexual immorality and controlling one's own body? Did that catch anybody off guard as we were reading this passage? Why would Paul start there, do you think? It doesn't, it doesn't seem that there was necessarily any more threat to the Thessalonian church in this area than any other church, so I don't think that was it. Why would he point these things out? Well, Paul says first, he says, abstain from, and the word there used is sexual immorality. It comes from one word, and if you've been in church, you've probably heard it, it's pornaya. And you can kind of hear in that pornaya, it kind of sounds similar to the English word pornography. Um, but this can refer to any sort of sexual immorality, though it seems, again, intercourse is specifically in view here in this text. And I point that out just to point out, Paul has a specific target, I think, that he's aiming toward. We get that because he refers to the passion of lust and the control of one's own body. So I think Paul's thinking about something a little bit more than just sight. It, it, it's similar use to what he uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We get the same wording in 1 Corinthians 6 when he says, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. I would point out as we're moving through here, you may say, man, it sounds like Paul is differentiating sins there. He is. And I know that's, that's a tough one for Christians to walk through, but Paul is absolutely differentiating sins here. Scripture is quite clear in this regard. Not every sin is the same. Every sin is equally damning before a holy God. The smallest sin is the, the same in its, in its damning effect on us, our separation from a holy God as the biggest quote-unquote sin. And yet, don't mistake for a minute, certain sins are destructive, heinously destructive in a way that Scripture, uh, scripture really teases out and, and makes clear. The implication here seems to be, if one's body is not under control and growing in holiness and honor, one cannot be following those commandments that Paul is lauding them for following. If you are living in a, in a life of faith and love before Almighty God, your body will not be out of control. The reason is sexual immorality is a denial of God's law and rule, and it's an elevation, or I would dare say it's even a worship of our own desires and will. We're taking God's will and God's rule in our lives, and instead we're supplanting that with our own. It, it, he points that out in this text. He says, passion of lust. You see that passion of lust? What Paul's aiming toward here is what Augustine referred to as the passions of our lives. It's the loves of your life. They're simply loving the wrong thing. They're loving their lust as opposed to, as we just read from John, loving the God who has saved them and walking in His ways. I, I point this out not to, not to try to confuse with, with talk of different, 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 uh, different destructive values of sin. I point this out because it's not without reason that when societies reject God, if we look on a social level, it's not without reason that when societies reject God, there is inevitably a celebration of sexual perversion. This is undeniable throughout Scripture. I mean, if you were just to think of some of the examples in Scripture, think Sodom and Gomorrah, think apostate Israel, think Babylon, think Rome, all throughout there we get these same things. A rejection of God inevitably expresses itself with sexual perversion. If you're to think of the modern West, what do we see in the modern West? And I say West generally, but what do we see within our own country? We see a rejection of God's law. We see an elevation of personal desire. We see a proliferation, an explosion, let's say, of sexual perversion. And there's destruction that inevitably follows these trends if there's not repentance. Now, praise God, there's times of repentance in Scripture. But this is a serious thing that we're bringing up. I think this is what Paul's talking about in the first chapter of Romans. In Romans chapter 1, he said, in verse 24 and 25, he said, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, 
to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Do you hear the reversal there? I don't want to worship God. I want to worship me. And this is the fruit then. If holiness is the fruit of the one, this then would be the inevitable and an immediate fruit of the other. I say that because, again, sexual immorality is essentially idolatry. It's a self-worship of our own desires. We get that same thing if you're taking notes. Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5 both speak about that at great length. But this is why I think John, we quoted from 1 John a minute ago, but this is why I think he wraps up that, that wonderful book of 1 John in, five, in chapter 5, verse 21. He says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. The problem is idolatry. It's loving the wrong thing. That's serious because God says, looking back to our text this morning, God says He's an avenger in all these things. An avenger in all these things. This is never far from biblical thinking. Christ is a loving Savior, and Christ is also a righteous avenger of evil. Those two things walk together like a hand in a glove. Righteous avenger of sin, and yet a glorious and wonderful Savior on the other. I would also point that out when Paul is talking about this, he says, the Lord is an avenger in all these things. You'll notice I said Christ. That word there used for Lord, kurios. It's the same word for Lord that comes out in the Greek. But this is Paul's way of referring to Christ specifically. Christ, he wants you to know, is the avenger. Christ is the Savior that we celebrate, and yet Christ is the avenger in all these things. That's important. Why? Because only God can judge. Only God can judge. And what does Christ do? Christ judges because he is truly God. Psalm 94, we hear these words, O Lord, and the word there for Lord is Yahweh. O Lord, God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, shine forth, rise up, O judge of the earth, repay to the proud what they deserve. Who is the one that judges the earth? God and God alone. Who is the judge that Paul speaks about? Christ, because he is truly God. Make no mistake, Rome at this time, what did they pronounce? Caesar is Lord, and Caesar will judge. Paul is shaking his fist at that with divine words saying, no, Christ is Lord of all, and Christ will judge all the earth. He is the avenger in all these things. What's the content then? Getting back to this. What is the content of Paul's instructions? He says, God has called us Christian, not to death, not to destruction. He's called us to holiness. We are given Christ's righteousness, and then he calls, remember he said that in the, past, the, the, the previous passage, you're given Christ's righteousness and holiness. Now you're to walk and grow in that. This is Paul's prayer that he mentioned back in chapter 3, verse 12 through 13, if you're taking notes, but we have little time this morning, so let's get to the third point. Third thing this morning as we close, what is the danger then of disregarding God's instructions? What's the danger then that Paul is trying to warn the Thessalonian church and all the other Christians? What is the danger then he would have us know about these things? Verse 8, Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Let's, let's walk through that one for a minute. He says, these are not men's opinions. This isn't Paul's 10, te you know, 10 tips to how to be a more successful Thessalonian. This is God's word to God's people. It's fundamentally different. So I, I point that out because we show much patience to one another. And, and, and I hope I don't get up on a little soapbox of my own here, but we show much patience toward one another. As I said, there's a lot of different children of God in this room. There, a lot of us are chewing on different types of things. A lot of us are struggling in different areas, but God has given us all as a body together that we may encourage and grow one another. You're here for a reason. There's not one person in this room that's here by mistake. God knows what his church needs and he supplies it in abundance. So we have patience with one another. I realize that what you are struggling with may not be what I'm struggling with, so I'm patient and I'm loving. And I pray that you are the same way with me as we are both pointing each other to what God has said and how to grow in these things. But with all that said, there's few things that should make a Christian run faster and run harder than somebody who teaches and leads others to disregard or ignore God's word. I'll repeat it. There is nothing that should make you turn tail and run than somebody who is teaching you to ignore or to disregard God's word. That leads to destruction. Scripture makes a very clear differentiation between those who teach and those who don't teach. And those who teach and teach error 
That's something that is, that is, and it's not just error. I'm not just talking about somebody misspeaking. Somebody may make a wrong point. Somebody may misspeak from the pulpit. I've said things before that I've had to come back and clarify and let me tell you what I mean. That's not what we're talking about. I'm saying somebody that laughingly scoffs at what God has said. <laughs> That's not for you. Run hard and fast. Examples of those are myriad, but I just want to point out a few because this is, I feel that this is where the Christian ought be wary in this world. Scripture calls us to be wary, not scared, not timid, but aware that there are those who would lead us astray in this world, and we're to cling tightly to God's Word in those regards. So again, the, the examples are myriad, but I, I would just say this as a couple of closing points. We disregard God when we, and one of the most, the most prolific examples is something that's really hard to say. I know I told you I was going to make it really difficult this morning. I'm not going to disappoint. Moral therapeutic deism. Don't, don't get bogged down. Let me explain. Moral therapeutic de deism. I heard somebody, I can't remember who it was off the top of my head, but he said this is the preferred religion of America um, in our century. Um, essentially what this is, is God wants you to be nice, moral, right? God wants you to be nice, so probably don't cuss as much as you should, and you know, don't throw bottles at people's houses, that sort of thing, moral. Um, there's also, God's here to make you feel better, therapeutic. What's God's role? He's here to make you feel good, right? How do you feel? Are you happy? That, that sort of thing. And then the third thing, the deism, he's not altogether involved in your daily life. So in other words, like you, you pretty much live your life. If, if you get down, you can call on God because he's here to cheer you up, and he probably doesn't want you to cuss so much. That's the preferred religion of America. And what does that do? It obscures grace and it denies God's commandments. It obscures grace and it denies God's commandments to his children, which are given for your good. I can't stress that part enough. This is the, this is the father telling the son, don't touch the stove. It's going to burn you. These are instructions for our life. It, it, we also see this, though. We see disregarding God when we unhitch from the Old Testament or the New Testament. And I say that because that's become very popular in some shockingly large churches. It was first an unhitching of the Old Testament. Now it's an unhitching of the New Testament. I'm not sure where they preach from on Sunday mornings. Beware those who laugh and scoff at what God has written in His Word. We also, we've experienced this for years from so-called red-letter-only Christians. Those who would say, you know, pretty much if Christ doesn't say it in the Gospels, it doesn't really mean anything. Or those who would pit Paul versus Jesus. Paul's real mean, probably shouldn't read Thessalonians, just focus on the Christ of the Gospels. That's an obscuring of, again, God giving all of His Word for your good, His good commandments. We also hear this from people who would say such things as God shouting about materialism and religious pride, but whispering about sexual sin, which again has been preached from American pulpits, very large ones. Does it sound like Paul's whispering? It sounds, it sounds rather clear to me. This is the fourth one. When we isolate God to the box of Sunday morning service and our own personal quiet times, while rejecting His rule over every area of our life, we're missing what Paul is talking about here. The good commands of the righteous King that extend over everything that He has made. God is the God of all things. His rule is over all of life. We can't put God in the box of the Sunday morning. I, I, I give these just as a few examples, but I think they exemplify the point here. Let me, let me wrap up with this. Paul is writing to the Thessalonians for their encouragement in the last days. You remember how we began this letter? Paul knows you're under the pressure. You're seeing the opposition and the persecution. I'm writing to make sure the tempter hasn't tempted you, that the pressure hasn't been too much for you. I'm here to encourage you. How do you do that? You look to what God's called you to. Those two are not opposing it is not burdensome. It is life-giving for us to look the way God has called us to follow Him. When we disregard those things, when we disregard God's instructions, we are obscuring hope. Do you get that? When we ignore what God has commanded others to do and pretend like God has not said, we are robbing Christians of what Paul says is our encouragement in these last days. Don't rob each other of hope. And hope comes through following God in the way He's called us to. And as Paul said, this disregards not man. You're not offending me nor anyone else. This, this offends God, who Paul says is an avenger in all these things. So, in closing, I know this is heavy, this is heavy stuff today. But man, this is important. And it's important that we get the hope right. 
Hope is not something that I deem it to be. Hope is what God says it is. And following God closely, being that trusting child that is holding tightly to our Father's hand, that's where the hope and encouragement lies. Not in the platitudes and the empty, wasted words of this world. Turn to God and be saved. That's the message Paul's giving the Thessalonians. So, to close this morning, oh, I could preach another sermon, but you guys, you guys would probably oppose that. <laughs> We will continue this next week, but let's, let's focus on what Paul is saying here. God has given his children his Holy Spirit. If you're a child of God, which means God has saved you by his grace, you have felt the conviction of sin, you have felt God pulling you to himself, and you have responded with love and adoration, repenting of your sins and following the Savior. If that's you, God's given you nothing short of his Holy Spirit. In other words, God will accomplish this in his children. That's why this is a joyful command that is not burdensome. I walk in his footsteps because he gives me the strength to walk in his footsteps. Every Christian, he gives this, this strength. So with that in mind, remember those instructions, those same instructions he's giving the Thessalonians. Remember what we've been taught. Walk in a way that's pleasing to God. And Paul, as he's writing to the Thessalonians, and I think this applies to us as well, keep increasing more and more, as the day seems to be drawing near, keep growing in your faith. Keep increasing more and more as you walk closer and closer with the one who has saved you. Brothers and sisters, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. God, I thank you so much that you don't leave us guessing in this world. Lord, you don't save us and throw us to the wolves. You don't make a way of salvation and throw it out there and hope that we find it in the dark with blind eyes. God, thank you that you are a God who is intimately involved with your children. Lord, thank you that you draw us by your grace, that you shine your light into our darkness, that you give us the faith and the belief that we need God, thank you that you provide everything in the completed work of your Son. Lord, as I read this passage, I'm reminded, Lord, I can think of many ways that seem right to me, but their end is death. Lord, I want to follow you in the way you've called me to follow you. I want to walk closely with you. And I know, Lord, that as we do that as a people of God, Lord, we will experience the true joy, the true peace, the true happiness that you so richly provide. God, please give us the faith to follow closely. We love you, and it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.